Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Queen's Roundtable. I'm Evangelist Prophetess Valerie Ammons and I am so glad that you have chosen to break bread with me today. And to my right is my son Aaron Ammons and we're going to be talking about successful protesting and a few other little things that kind of tie into that. So without any further ado, let's go to the throne. Almighty God, in your precious Son, Jesus' name, if and when we said something that we misrepresented you, God, we repent right now in Jesus' name. God, we praise and thank you for being a forgiving and a forgetting God. God, we lift up UPTV. We lift up our communities. We lift up our world. God, we ask you to send the laborers to the heads of states. And God, we ask you to send people that are going to provide love and peace and joy, the fruits of the Spirit, that our world will be a better place to live in. in Jesus Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And again, welcome. And so we've been uh, talking about protests, what successful protesting is. We've been talking about um, how to protect our children, uh, even the protests that the centennial children have where the car uh, ran into the children. So we're going to be talking uh, um, about a few things, but all tying in together. Uh, my son Aaron asked me today, how's that going to tie into the Queen's Roundtable? Well, it ties into by the Queen's Roundtable because we're mothers. And we want to nurture and protect our children. That's our job, is that we should protect our children. We should always be empowering them with accurate information and empowering them to be an empowerer to someone else. And so um, with all the things that's going on, the uh, non-indictment of uh, the police officer for Mr. Garner and for Mike Brown and for numerous other um, African-American people that have been unjustly brutalized by the police department and we pay their salaries and I, I don't want you to take any more of my money until we get this right. That's my personal opinion. These are my taxes that pays their salaries and until you get that right just eliminate mine. Don't take mine because I don't want to contribute. <laughs> I understand. Uh, I, I don't. It doesn't quite work like that, but I understand. <laughs> I, what, I, understand I said I point. didn't. I didn't want them to. I didn't say they wasn't going to. All right, I but this you. is my desire because I want my children to be safe. My grandchildren and my great grandchildren to be safe. I want them to to eat the good of the land. I want them to live that abundant life. That's the reason why Jesus came. And so, if we have peaceful protest. And we want it to be successful. So I'm asking Aaron to explain to me what successful protesting is. If that's uh, successful protesting, um, it depends on what you have set out to do. So some people feel like um, nonviolence is uh, if you have a nonviolent disposition or that is your focus, like uh, much of the civil rights movement then people feel like as long as you are uh, not harming anyone or harming anyone's property, then that would be a nonviolent, <clears throat> excuse me, a nonviolent protest um, where you may just simply walk down the street. You may be walking in the street. It, you, a nonviolent protest along those lines, basically, as long as you don't harm anyone or damage anybody's property, um, that would be considered that. Civil disobedience is another form okay. of, of protest. Civil dis disobedience means that you're going to openly and defiantly go against a law that's on the books um, and you don't care if you get arrested in, in, in the process, right? Usually a nonviolent uh, protest has informed the police department, other people, what's going on so that your route is secured and all those kind of different things and you don't typically violate any of the laws, right? But a civil disobedience says that you are going to do something intentionally um, to be arrested. You're going to violate the law on purpose. And then some of what you see, whether it's in Ferguson or some of the other places where you see people who riot and stuff like that or who rebel against the decision that was made, um, they feel like there's an aspect of that that is also considered successful. Mm -hmm. um, and when you study some of the... Uh, the history of the United States and what happens after that. Some could argue that that sort of burning or um, rebellion also has a place as uh, would be considered a successful 
protest mm -hmm. um, because of the jobs that may come from behind it, because of whatever reasons it may be, um, that level of protest may also be deemed successful mm -hmm. if it helps achieve a particular objective. So um, that it's a little controversial for some people because people don't like to see cities up in flames. There's a lot of conversation about whether or not a particular group or an African American neighborhood should set their the stores in their yeah, own yes. community on that's, fire that's and things like that. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of conversation around that as well that says that what makes the average person who's uh, who's watching the show or watching the protest uh, think that the individuals who set those fires didn't set them intentionally, meaning that. Um, is this the mom and pop store that's nice to everybody, that looks out for everybody, mm -hmm. or is this a predatory lending establishment in the community that nobody likes and they set it on fire? Mm -hmm. You know, okay, sometimes there's a there's some strategy mm -hmm. even behind what may be perceived as chaotic. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's what took place, but I'm saying that there has been uh, in the past people have looked into that type of thing and they found that it was not as haphazard as people thought, that there was some actual um, intent mm -hmm. behind who in particular was targeted. Mm -hmm. And so you're the organ, you're an organizer, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, so how would you have organized a successful protest? Mm -hmm. Say, uh, well, I know you organized the one for Kiwan Carrington, and that's actually how CU Citizens started. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you uh, successfully organize? Well, organizing is not as scientific as some people think. It's not a, it's really about taking the passion and the energy. So what I would hope to see, for instance, in a situation like Ferguson or uh, in New York or even now, seeing what these young people are doing here locally, take the energy, the frustration and the pain from that and direct that energy into an identified change or need for the community. So let's say, for instance, uh, rather than to do an action for the sake of doing an action, you do an action um, with the intent of using that energy to bring about a change in the educational system or the economic system or the criminal justice system. But you say, we want, for instance, uh, school resource officers out of the schools. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we feel like is necessary. If that was going to be something, then they would do this demonstration and they could sustain that demonstration and say that this is one of the three things that we're asking for that we'd like to see happen. But to do it with a strategic um, model or with a strategy in mind to actually gain something tangible that would um, be in the best interest of everybody once it's implemented. Mm -hmm. So you have to sit down and think about those things before you actually go out and just kind of do something just because you want to do something. Right. So there's a collaboration of the members uh, yes. that sits down and strategizes how mm -hmm. all of these things, are, uh, how, what we want to happen. Now, do you have to let, um, say, the police department know no. or... You do not have to let them know. Mm -hmm. You do not have to inform them that we're going to go and have this demonstration. They would like for you to do that. Mm -hmm. And we have done that sometimes in the past, and there have been times when we did not do that at all. Mm -hmm. There have been times when we went f and filed for a permit and all that kind of different stuff, and that most of the time we do not. Most of the time the demonstrations were on the, on the sidewalk. We just simply held a, a single file line when they got too big. Then there were times when we did spill out into the street. But we did, usually the demonstrations had received enough attention that police were in the area and they would help, you know, the traffic flow and all that kind of different stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, those were sort of nonviolent um, protests and demonstrations that we've done in the past. But you are not required to let them know, no. Mm -hmm. So when you're letting them know about your demands, do mm -hmm. you uh, serve them um, like a, a, a complaint? Well, or do you well, just state it while you demonstrate it? Well, I'll, I'll say, for instance, when we did the um, demonstration against the, the killing of Kiwan Carrington, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, that we did was to, we gave them three initiatives, a, uh, three proposals saying that we felt like, for instance, the officers 
who kill someone on duty or anything like that or injure, cause great bodily harm, mm -hmm. should be drug tested. Mm -hmm. We feel like they should live in the, the neighborhood that they police. You know, So sometimes you put forth a, a proposal and mm -hmm. say, hey, listen, these are concrete things that we feel like can come out of that. That is probably, that's more of a structural um, change that you're looking for in the system, mm -hmm. right? The use of force policy or something like that. And then there's the, the, um, the organizing aspect of it, the mobilizing aspect of it. We always want um, to take whatever uh, situation like what has happened and politicize the, the community understand, for the young people to understand what's going on, for them, for them to get involved. For An illustration would be when uh, the desire for tasers initially mm -hmm. in Champaign and uh, the arrest of Patrick Thompson and Martel Miller for the video, CU Citizens for Peace and Justice was formed out of that. Mm -hmm. The Breakfast Club was formed on the heels of the killing of Kiwan Carrington. What you want is to be able to create new organizations, uh, new, bring new spirit, new people into the fold of the movement to, for change uh, every time one of these type of events takes place. And since they continue to happen, then they continue to give us um, the opportunity to organize more people. And that's what you're seeing happen with the students at Central, at Centennial, what you're seeing happen all across the country. Right. I've, I've noticed that uh, with all of the different uh, protesters, they're lying down as if they're dead, and, and, um, and it's all over the country. I've even seen some in India that was posted mm -hmm. on Facebook where people are supporting this injustice, where our uh, young... Fighting this injustice. Fighting, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Fighting this injustice that we are being plagued with here. And it is, um, I mean, it, it, it cuts to the root of me because I have um, young children, young grandchildren uh, that I'm, I'm concerned. I'm not afraid, but I'm concerned for them mm -hmm. because they're being taught in this day and time that I'm a free man or I'm a free woman. Mm -hmm. But indeed, the injustices does not pile up to that. Mm -hmm. What, you know, freedom, freedom to, um, as they killed the man who was uh, going into his home, uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, they killed a seven-year-old little girl that was l lying on the couch because of an accident. So if, and, and right here in Champaign, what, they shoot the house up over baby beds, and mm -hmm. there has to be some concern for life, and there's not any concern for life. Well, uh, there's two different, um, there's a couple of different arguments that people put forth. One is that there has to be accountability for those actions. And part of the outrage is that um, people are seeing over and over again where police officers from city to city, from state to state, do not suffer any sort of real negative yes. consequences uh, or are, in, are imprisoned or, or prosecuted uh, from city to city, from state to state. You, there's a, a clear culture where police officers are vindicated and justified uh, for their, uh, their, uh, their actions are justified. And people can see um, either they're there and they see what took place or there's the historical account that says this has been happening too long or in the case of, of Eric Garner, we, we watch it in plain sight, yes. right? And so people are saying uh, the outrage and the frustration is in relationship to that. The other part of that is that the officers go into a, let's say for instance, do we believe right here in Champaign-Urbana that officers would discharge their weapons into a dorm facility or into a university facility because someone was fleeing into that facility. Mm -hmm. Highly unlikely Likely, yes. that that's going to take place because of the backlash that could come from that, because of the likelihood that their bullet may hit somebody else or anything. Right. Yet the incident that you um, uh, uh, bring up about the uh, woman who lived in Garden Our Hills, hills yes. when the young man ran into her house and the Champaign Police Department fired shots all in there, bullets landed all in the back of chairs and all kind of stuff. 
there's a disposition or there's a uh, a position by some in the community that say that there's a you police the African American community different than the way you police other communities that you do things in our community that you wouldn't do in other communities. It's obvious. <laughs> and so when Kiwan Carrington was killed, Martel Miller had said had told the chief at that time had told the head of the NAACP at that time that he has repeatedly saw champagne officers in routine situations with young men with their guns drawn on mm -hmm. them. And he had to intervene a couple of times and say, hey, listen, those bullets don't travel backwards. You, why are you pulling guns on these young men in our communities like mm -hmm. this? And you're especially not doing it on campus and in right, other places exactly. in the community. And lo and behold, weeks later, Kiwan Carrington was dead. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that people are putting forth saying that this is a difference in how you police this community versus this community, regardless of the number of calls for service and all those different things. There's an attitude, there's a disposition about the officers exactly. who go into that area that say that I can behave this way over here, mm -hmm. but I know I better not behave this way over here. Right. And um, I'm saying, I mean, you have to, that has to be across the board. If I police the, the, the campus this way, I have to police Garden Hills this way. Mm -hmm. So if this is the, the, the vow that I took, so, you know, mm -hmm. the oath that I take, that I'm going to serve and protect, mm -hmm. then I should be doing just that. As yeah. with... Well, you know, one of the things I, I just really wanted to... to to share something about what you just said. Because most people, when we were talking about organizing and what can you do and how people get involved, most people don't see that the solutions that we're looking for are inside of each other. That's the importance of organizing and mobilizing. mobilizing okay. The solution is in you. The <laughs> answer right. is in you when we get together. So you said, you mentioned unintentionally, uh, or just coincidentally, campus and Garden Hills. Mm -hmm. Now, those of us who've been working on these issues for a while, we know that in Garden Hills, the African Americans who live over there were being ticketed for jaywalking. Mm -hmm. In essence, jaywalking with no sidewalks. Right, exactly. This is how mm -hmm. absurd it is, with no sidewalks. Yet jaywalking takes place on a daily basis every minute of the hour At on campus, on campus mm -hmm. right? So you, you can see that, but there are no tickets being given out to that degree no. on campus the way that they're given out over here in the African-American community, in a community with no sidewalks. <laughs> right. And that's, the, that's, that's a very clear, very concise example of how two communities are policed different for the exact same offense. Okay. And when and you, you saw that. Oh, yes. You see, and you, so it doesn't take a whole, it, this is what I'm trying to get across to people. Sometimes we see people in positions of authority or we see people who've been doing things for a long time and you think you're not as smart as them or you, you can't see what they see. Sure you do. Yes. Absolutely. You, what you see is what you see. You, it, believe your eyes. They are not lying to you. What you see is what you see. And you need to bring your energy, bring what yes. you bring to the table, to these conversations, to the CU Citizens meetings at 4 o'clock or wherever there may be an organization that needs your input. And that's exactly what we knew. We need you to come together to be with us. Don't wait until something happens to you and then come running to see you, citizen. Mm -hmm. Be a part of that. You know, be a part. Let your, let your voice be heard. We're not afraid. Let your voice be heard because we have the right to peaceful protest. Mm -hmm. And just like the children uh, or in Centennial, mm -hmm. uh, I was always taught in every rules of the road book, it says the pedestrian has the right of way. So why was she not ticketed mm -hmm. for plowing into some children? I mean, the mindset. I mean, I'm a woman. How am I going to run my car into some children? Children. In front of a school in a school zone. zone. <laughs> I mean, and she doesn't get a ticket? Come on now. 
Come on. So I, 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 that's why I'm, I'm so I'm so concerned because I have all of my my grandsons are here in, in, in Champaign and my great grandsons. I want them to be safe. I have paid my money, my tax dollars for them to be safe. I demand. I demand that that and they you, are safe. And you have every right uh, to be able to sleep at night and to be comfortable not thinking that your children or your grandchildren are going to be harmed uh, in any way, uh, in particular by the police. And I, I want to say this because I know somebody who's listening is going to say, you are, what about black on black violence oh. and black on black crime? You know, these are two different discussions. They're two different discussions. Marches, and I have been a part of marches or demonstrations that were a stop to violence march or demonstration, right? But we're talking about state sanctioned violence and murder. That's what this discussion is about. So we don't get, we don't mix apples and oranges in right. the conversation. State sanctioned murder and state sanctioned violence is a different conversation than when another citizen harms another citizen. That's a completely different situation, especially when the state sanctioned officers or officials are not paying any of the consequences, negative consequences that the citizens who do the exact same things are paying. And they're not coming, you know, the, the officers are not coming and say, hey, you know, I made a mistake, something went off and I accidentally shot your child. My God, my, 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 you know, I am so hurt. Here's my deepest sympathy, which would be at least something to come and say, but you just kill my kid and keep it moving. And that's, that just does not wash. And it doesn't create the context for genuine relationships. That's right. It doesn't create a healthy police and community right. relationship. Um, and we tie all this stuff back to because we want to learn from these other situations. But to this day, uh, the killing of this young man, Kiwan Carrington, no one has stepped forward and said, my finger was on yes. that trigger. And I am the one who is responsible for this young man's death as far as me pulling that particular trigger. No one has. Yes. And so when the chief of police at that time and the person who trains the officers on how to handle weapons gives the community the response that the gun just went off. Yes. That's disrespectful. Thank you. Um, yes. it, 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 um, it undermines and erodes any possibility of us being able to move forward as a community in a genuine fashion because you refuse to take any responsibility but yet you force me to take responsibility. Exactly. And, and you made uh, a statement about um, like uh, about um, black on black crime and I don't you know I always go back to the root and the root of this all is slavery mm -hmm. and they always pitted us against one another. They divided us. They always pitted us against one another. And do you not think that that in this year, 2014, what you intended is still working? Hmm. And that's what we want to break down. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with my son. But if you're angry because... Of, uh, of you don't like it here in America. This is some of the statements that I've seen on Facebook. Go back to Africa. We didn't steal y'all. We didn't steal y'all. We built this country on the sweat of our brows and picking cotton and all of that. We didn't come over here and take y'all. So if you mad at anybody, you got to be mad at your ancestors. You can't be mad at us because we're trying to work out of that slavery mentality. You know, I think that these are the, um, the types of conversations, very real, very passionate, very frank conversations that, uh, that spaces need to be created more often for us to have these types of conversations so that, you know, you can really get what's, off of you, what's in your heart out and what's on your mind out and then say, okay, so now what do we do with this? How do we move forward? Um, because we're here, we're not going anywhere yes. uh, willingly, <laughs> right? right? You know, and 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 none of the individuals or uh, whatever ethnic group who's here now uh, plans to leave. This is where we are. This is our country. This is what we stand for and what we believe in. But there has to be accountability. There has to be um, responsibility and equality yes. um, uh, for for the citizens here. And so I, I think it's fair for us to be able to to 
to express that passion without being called unpatriotic or un-American or hateful and right. all that kind of different things that we see happen on a regular basis simply because we are trying to uh, deal with um, the results of a situation that we didn't voluntarily yeah, we, come into. Th that's right. And even with the Kevin Gardner, uh, Eric, mm -hmm. Eric Gardner, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, Eric Gardner situation, there is a possibility the police wasn't supposed to be there anyway mm -hmm. because that's uh, against the tobacco and firearm. Well, you know, on the show this morning, uh, uh, that shameless plug for Higher Ground, 90.1 FM when you're listening <laughs> down, um, 8 to 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings, uh, we had a, a gentleman came in uh, this morning and said that there had been a fight and actually Mr. Garner was uh, reported to have uh, interrupted mm -hmm. and broke up the fight. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, that's how the police got called to the scene. And I, I, and I should say, and, uh, and we should always analyze these things as fair as possible. In many of the situations we describe, um, and not all, but let's say, for instance, in um, um, the Mike Brown situation, that's the hottest piece that's going uh, alongside Eric Garner, is that allegedly, and it appears as though it's true, uh, Mike did some things that brought some attention to himself, mm -hmm. whether it was going into the grocery store with this, uh, and, and taking something out of the grocery store or walking down the middle of the street. There are some things that you can do that I'm going to tell my son, don't, why are you walking down the middle right, of the street? Exactly. Right? Exactly. And to why are you, and you shouldn't be taking nothing from nobody or stealing nothing from nobody. So there's a certain amount of responsibility and accountability that we have to make sure that we press upon our children uh, and ourselves. But then after that, then there's also a certain amount of responsibility and accountability that should come with those who engage them on, on law enforcement. So if he was breaking up a fight, so why should he be arrested? Uh, we've had the the end of the it show. Goes it goes, fast, it goes it? really fast and this is an actual topic that is close to our hearts to all African American people and I still say we should do as a race, not as a race of people, but as people on this earth being uh, under, under in love and peace and harmony for one another, whether crossing all color bearers is second chapter of Chronicles in the seventh chapter, I mean, second Chronicles, the seventh chapter and the 14th verse. We should, we should repent of our sins and humble That's ourselves, right. turn from our wicked ways and look toward heaven so God can heal our land because our land is needing a healing. Thank you very much.